It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're thrilled to have with us tonight Dr. Lori Marbus. Lori Marbus, MD, MBA, is a double board certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician utilizing food as medicine since 2012. She is the managing editor for the Plant Nutrition Project's International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. She is also co-founder of the Healthy Human Revolution, whose mission is to provide individuals with the knowledge, tools, and mindset to successfully adopt and sustain a whole food, plant-based diet. She received her dual degrees, MD and MBA, from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine and the TTU School of Business. She was awarded the Texas Tech University School of Medicine Gold-Headed Cane Award, a symbol for excellence in the art of medicine and the care of patients. She is also, that wasn't enough, uh, she is a United States Air Force veteran who has served in the Middle East and South America. She is a wife, mom of three grown children, author, speaker, and an avid runner. Dr. Marvis's presentation tonight is entitled, What Your Doctor Didn't Learn in Medical School Could Kill You. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laurie Marvis. Thank you for so much for inviting me and bringing us out from Colorado. Um, we first originally came here almost 27 years ago on our honeymoon, and so this is such a beautiful place. We are so happy to be here, and we brought our three kids with us a, three, a few years ago. So we're so happy to be able to see your beautiful island and, and share such an important message. So today I titled this, What Your Doctor Didn't Learn in Medical School Could Kill You. And some might consider that an inflammatory statement, but I think it's the truth. And I hope I've convinced you by the end of it why it's so important that we change medical education. Earlier this evening, I was blessed to be able to speak to your local medical students, and they got really excited at the potential. And many of the things that I spoke to, they hadn't even heard of. So I think that's exciting to think that there may be opportunities. And my own daughter is a third year medical student at also at Texas Tech. I, there's another techie here. Who else? Is, this is amazing. Yay, that's awesome. So that's a, it's a school in West Texas. It's an amazing school. Um, but it, it is such an important message and I'm excited to share it with you this evening. So it all started with a rifle and people go, what do you mean a rifle? You're at a vegetarian society, you're talking about guns. But this is actually Rifle Colorado. How many of you have been to Colorado? Oh, wonderful, excellent. How many of you have been to Rifle Colorado? Ah, oh, wow, Texas Tech, Rifle, this is great. And Fantastic. Well, Rifle Colorado is actually, it's, the type of place it is kind of denotes the name. You're going to have a lot of ranchers, hunters, things like that. It's a town of about 12,000 people. I went there with my family um, after I got out of the Air Force. I was stationed in Langley, Virginia, or at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. And I could literally see the Colorado River from my front door. Beautiful place. I was at a, what they call a critical access hospital. So this is a hospital, there's no ICU, you're doing everything, inpatient, outpatient, um, nursing homes. So we, have, we see everybody in the society, from the little ones to the old ones. My oldest patient was 104, my youngest was a newborn. So it's really fun to be a family medicine doctor to influence those type of lives. So why did it start in Rifle, Colorado? Well, I grew up, and eating a, you know, probably a healthier version of a standard American diet. I didn't have a lot of, um, we didn't have a lot of money, so we grew a lot of our own vegetables, but we did eat meat and dairy. So I just continued that as we got married and had children, so I thought I was doing right. You know, you'd buy the turkey bacon instead of the regular bacon, you're thinking you're doing those things right. But what happened one day was that I had a patient come in and said, Dr. Marbus, meat and dairy upset my stomach. Well, what would you tell someone like that? Stop eating meat and dairy. <laughs> and what happened was she came back in 30 days. And I had made some little notations in her chart saying, okay, she stopped, she's gonna stop meat and dairy for 30 days and come back and we'll see how she does, kind of adding foods back. It was kind of like an elimination type diet. You may have heard of something like that before. And so what happened was she didn't come back alone. She actually brought her daughter who was 16 at the time. 
Now, mind you, a 16-year-old daughter had actually, her mom pulled her out of school to come to a doctor's appointment with her mom. How much fun is that? So this must have been an important message because her mom wanted her to speak to me directly about what had happened over the course of 30 days. So she had been with her mom. Remember, we're in Rifle, Colorado. There's not gonna be places that you can go eat. There's actually a cafe called Shooters. I'm not making this up, you can Google it, where the waitresses actually wear real guns. Okay, this actually exists. <laughs> I wish I could make it up, but I can't. That's, that's actual truth. So she would have to go to the grocery store. She had to buy her food. She was making food at home. So she's not buying, you know, junk processed type vegan food. She's actually buying whole food because that's all that was available where we were. So what happened was her daughter wanted to support her mom. So she went on the diet with her. And during that 30 days, she pulled herself off. The 16 year old pulled herself off two attention deficit disorder medications all by herself. She brought her to the appointment. She goes, Dr. Marbus, why was she able to do that? And not in a sense like she was mad, but she was like, why didn't someone tell me I could ki change my kid's diet and she could stop these medications that have really serious potential side effects? And I said, I don't know, but that is really cool. <laughs> I was like, what did you do? She goes, well, we ate your diet. I was like, I didn't give you a diet. I just said, stop eating meat and dairy. I was like, what did you eat? She goes, it was fruits and vegetables. We had a lot of beans. We had some rice. So it's like, you just ate plants. She goes, yeah, it's like a dimmer switch coming on slowly in my brain. It's like, apparently I'm very thick skulled. It took a bit. And I was so excited at the potential. I was like, wow, no one's ever described that to me, that that's what nutrition could do. I was thinking, I was honestly just focused on the ADD side. Because in a family practice, I mean, I, I don't know the exact percentage, which is a high percentage of folks that are going to be on ADD meds. I'm like, what could I do with these kids? So I Googled. <laughs> First book that came up was the China study. And I know you've had Dr. Campbell here before, who's also a good friend of mine. And the amazing thing was I read that book in two days. I was so amazed at the potential of turning off cancer doing all these incredible things. So remind you, this is back in 2012. So there wasn't a whole lot that I could find, but I did find someone that everyone here knows is Dr. McDougall's site. Dr. McDougall had some good articles for physicians because how do I stop prescribing medications? How do I stop someone from taking insulin? When should I take someone off insulin? What about blood pressure medications? So it was a great, resource for me because there wasn't a whole lot eight years ago. So that was how it all started in Rifle, Colorado. And in this, my mind's going, what am I going to do? How am I going to share this with my patients? But that also means that I have to change myself. Now remember, I have a 13-year-old, a 15-year-old, and an 18-year-old at home, and my poor husband. And I'm going, boy, there, this is going to be an interesting challenge. But I said, look, maybe I need to get a little bit more information. So what happened was I had a patient with lupus. How many of you here have heard of lupus? Right. It can be terminal in many cases. So this young woman was younger than me. She had been diagnosed with lupus about two to three years earlier. She came in, she was on 12 medications, 50 pounds overweight, and she was complaining of migraines that were just devastating her to the point that she was like, I think I need to quit working. I don't know if I can continue living. Now imagine being 40 years old and thinking you may have another 40 to 50 years of suffering with joint pain, daily migraines, all these things, being on medications that increase risk for all sorts of things like cancers and infections. That is not a life that we're supposed to be leading. How depressing. So then we have to worry about all of these other things, you know, the stress and the anxiety, not being able to, to actually you know, provide for yourself and your family. That was what was going on in her mind when she came to her 15 minute appointment, which is normal for a family practice doc these days. And as she's talking to me, hoping to get some guidance on what am I gonna do? What other medication am I gonna add to my stockpile? I was like, you know, I might need a guinea pig for this diet one more time before I go home and change this. I said, would you be willing to change your diet? What's on the end of your fork? 
I said, I just have a little experience with this, but I told her about the other patient. I said, would you be willing to experiment with me and be my guinea pig? I actually used those words and she said yes. I was like, okay, she's not gonna turn me into the board. <laughs> and so what happened was she um, started that diet that day, but before she left, we measured what's called a CRP. How many of you have heard of CRP? A C-reactive protein, so a few out there. It's an inflammatory marker that I can measure in someone's blood. So there's a normal level, but hers was three times the high normal. Okay, so that's a 300% increase of inflammation. And I said, you have to come back in two weeks because I can't wait to see how this experiment ends more than two weeks. So it's like a long vacation, right? So she came back in two weeks, eight pounds lighter, her migraines were gone, and her CRP had dropped to just outside normal. That was a Friday afternoon, and that was the last day I ate any animal products almost eight years ago. I went home, I said, we're done. I walked in the door, I threw down my purse, I took a garbage bag, and I threw everything that was any animal orientation of any kind out the door. And my husband's sitting there going, okay, well, this is interesting. He goes, you're still cooking, right? I was like, yeah, he goes like, okay. And he went on to lose 70 pounds and did his first Ironman this summer, or this spring, or actually no, it was September, September. So that's exciting, and <laughs> thank you. And I, and I will say, we're not spring chickens anymore. I mean, our kids are 25, 23, and 21. My daughter is, like I said, in medical school, all plant-based, so that worked. It took a while for some of them, but they did come around. And so that was how it all started in a little town in Western Colorado. So if they can do it here, you can do it anywhere. That's the main point. But it's the power of influence. All right, so there's a few things I'd just like to point out, a points to ponder as we talk tonight. First of all, the problem is we're getting sicker. Does anyone disagree with that statement? Okay, everyone agree? Yes, okay. All right, and our medical education teaches one to be reactive versus proactive. Would you also agree with that? Right, your doctor go, you go to see your doctor, the first thing they do is pull out a prescription pad or they send you for a referral for a procedure. There's very little talk regarding true prevention. All right, so this leads to what I describe as a sick care system, not a health care system, because that's what a sick care system would do, right? You respond when people are sick. A healthcare system would promote, you know, health promoting activities. Lifestyle medicine works, and that is really key, which we're going to discuss here in a moment. And why doctors like myself and some other doctors I've already met in the audience are key to the influence, the really the social change. We are in a very special place. All right, so how many? I know you're like, oh my goodness, I just went from lifestyle medicine to root cause analysis. How many of you have ever heard of a root cause analysis? Okay, a few. Well, let's talk a little bit about what that is. In a hospital setting or a medical setting, I was in the military, you'd have this as well. Let's say there was an unexpected death. Um, maybe a baby died in the NICU or in the newborn nursery or someone got an, an unusual infection. So this is what we call a sentinel event. This is an event that shouldn't have happened. So we do a root cause analysis. So what we're trying to do is get to the root of the problem. And there's some steps that we're gonna go through. So what I like to do is kind of go through a root cause analysis of chronic disease with you. How many of you know what chronic disease is? Can you give me some examples, anybody? Diabetes? Asthma. Asthma, heart disease cancer, those type of things. So that's what we're gonna talk about. The true definition of chronic disease is something that lasts more than three months, typically past a year, and they say it's not reversible. That I would actually disagree with, and we'll get to some more good stories here in a minute. So let's talk about root cause analysis. Number one, the first five parts. Let's define the problem. So let's look around. What type of problem do we have? We're getting sicker, right? Chronic disease is literally destroying, let's, if we just talk about the United States, our economy, it's devastating to lives. You know, people are suffering and dying early. Okay, then we go and we collect the data. All right, so how do we know that this problem even exists? 
Well, we spend 3.3 to 3.5 trillion dollars in a healthcare system that's not working. Um, that's the most recent information I have from 2017. So then we go, what we do is we do a very broad sweep and we try to identify the possible causal factors. So what are the potential things that you have heard that are causing chronic disease? Can you guys give me some ideas? Medication. Medications, food, what else? Stress. Stress. Environment. The environment. Okay, so all of these things could be compounding the issue of chronic disease. Bar any of those the root cause? Let's find out. I'll give you my, my opinion anyway. Oop. So what we're going to do is identify the root cause, and then we have to actually come up with some solutions. And the solutions part is the fun part, because that's where you get to see people literally change their lives. Like your own Dr. Ruth Heydrich, who literally overcame stage four breast cancer. So what I'm going to do here, there's a video. Um, it's about a minute in 50 seconds or so. And what this is going to do, it's actually going to kind of go through one person's life who has chronic disease. We're going to start in the present and watch them go back in time in their life. So you can see the choices that were made that led them to end up in an ER. It's really, really powerful. Heart attack. 5'9", 300 pounds, 32 years old. How the hell does that happen? How many of you find that very powerful? Absolutely, right? So this is just one person's journey to end up on the hospital ER table. But this happens every single day. 600,000 Americans will die this year of a heart attack. One in three of us have either prediabetes or diabetes. This is not okay. This should be alerting everybody sitting here and everyone around the country is like, this is not normal. We have come to expect that chronic disease is normal. I have to tell you, it is not. One other problem I'd like to talk about is that, the, you remember the points to ponder, this is our problem. So we're going back to our root cause, the cause and the effect, right? So let's talk about just some of the data from the CDC. What I did is I took maps that are already available and it's going to go over a course of 25 years and you're going to see obesity starting and then what comes behind it is diabetes. Diabetes is a devastating disease. Okay, there's nothing simple about diabetes. You increase your risk for all other chronic diseases when you have diabetes. It is, I, I, it's a beast of an issue. Let's just kind of follow through here. So what you're going to see here on your left is obesity trends across states. Every year it's just ticking up. So as you see the obesity go up, you start seeing diabetes come right behind it. So it's just kind of its shadow. So wherever you see obesity go, you see the shadow following along and the trend of diabetes. But this could be heart disease, this could be high blood pressure, it could be a lot of those things that we mentioned earlier. And then at the end, You'll see Colorado, that's, that's my state. 
But remember, it was there that my journey began. So we still have issues, even in a very healthy state of Colorado. All right, so 2015. And what you're going to see now is this compilation where they took 1994, the year my daughter was born, actually. You see here? And then see, as we move into the southeast, it gets darker, and then the whole United States. Obesity, and then the diabetes trend, just follow it. That is where we're headed. Hawaii, you are this little tiny dot, but you're still red. Okay. All right, so let's just learn a few facts. Well, really, how sick are we? What are, the, what are the stats of all these different chronic diseases I keep mentioning? First of all, the CDC says 60% of U.S. adults have one or more chronic medical condition. Would you believe I have a chronic medical condition? Yeah. At the age of 25, I was diagnosed with thyroid disorder or hypothyroidism. It developed during the birth of my second child. So I will tell you I was on medications for 15 years. I went to a plant-based diet. My dosage dropped for four years in a row, still on a very low dose. But that was, for me, amazing. For a disease that I had for 15 years to get better was incredible. And all those allergies I suffered, because I thought my mother had them, I thought I just was going to suffer as well, hmm, they went away in 90 days. I got a phone call that one of three medications I was taking for my allergies had to be, it was ready for renewal, but I had an entire bottle still because every morning I would wake up and my sneezing and my witchy watery eyes would tell me to take my medicine. But what I didn't realize was I was actually feeling better and I didn't need it anymore. 90 days and I've taken maybe two Allegra in eight years. And that's usually when I'm in places that are, I'm just not used to or like Southeast Florida, we won't go there, but anyway, <laughs> that's one of the places. All right. So those chronic diseases, now mind you, that's only 60% of the population, accounts for 90% of the $3.3 trillion we spend annually on chronic disease, or healthcare in the US. So I want to go back to the obesity issue, OK? Obesity-associated comorbidities. What that means is that because someone is obese, they're going to be related to these hypertension. So 45% of cases of hypertension are because of obesity. 18% of high cholesterol because of obesity. 35% of heart disease and 85% of type 2 diabetes. That is very, very telling. So this is one thing to understand is that you can't just say, oh, this is diabetes oh, this is my heart disease, this is what I have to do for my high cholesterol, this is what I do for whatever. These are all interrelated. This is a network issue. There's not going to be one thing that I can do to prevent heart disease and not take care of everything else. This all goes together. Just a few more sad facts that also stands for the standard American diet. <laughs> all right, 71.6% of adults age 20 and older are overweight or obese. But this also affects our children, and I think this as a mom really bugs me, and especially as a doctor who went into medicine to take care of kids. And it was a kid, my own sister, who was sick, and a doctor cured her, and that's why I went into medicine. But let's look at what's happening to our children. First of all, 20.6% of adolescents, 12 to 19, are obese. 18.4 children aged 6 to 11 are obese. And look at this one. 13.9 children, 2 to 5, are obese. So now what's going to happen? Remember those maths that I was talking about? What do you think is going to happen to those kids? So now instead of being a 60-year-old that develops type 2 diabetes, what if you're 16? Instead of 20 years of suffering and potential side effects, now I have 50 or 60 years of suffering. What do you think that does to a community, a, a city, a state, or a nation? Well, who's going to be in our military? When I was active duty as a physician, we were sending people out of the military. We were discharging them from the military because they had diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea, asthma, all of these things that we've been talking about. 
we're headed really to the end of a cliff. So now let's talk about our poor eating habits. Okay, federal guidelines. This is just the minimum recommendation that the federal government says, come on guys, can you at least get two, you know, about five servings of fruits and vegetables a day? I consider this fairly anemic, and probably many of you, I'm speaking to the, you know, kind of preaching to the choir, would probably get that in one meal. But if you're not, we need to talk afterwards. <laughs> So just one in 10 adults meet the federal fruit and vegetable recommendations. Now mind you, that was only one and a half to two cups of fruit, which is like uh, one and a half apples, and two to three cups per day of vegetables. So let's remember, seven out of 10 of the top chronic diseases in the United States, or death, actually of death, are chronic disease, right? And all this chronic disease goes back to many things that we call lifestyle medicine, which we'll get to here in a second. Just a few other quick facts here. I'm gonna ask you guys, let's see, I'm gonna do a little poll. So what percentage of adults age 18 or older actually can, who meet the physical guidelines that they recommend in the United States? So what that is, it's 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. What's the percentage you think in the US? Eight. Eight? <laughs> well, that's really bad, okay. I think you're gonna be surprised, what? 20%. 20%, okay. This is what I found off the CDC, 53%, which is quite surprising, right? And since 1990, that has been slowly trending upward, but are we getting healthier? So is exercise the only problem or the cure? No, it's, a, it's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. But that seems to be what everyone tells you, right? You need to lose weight, you need to exercise more. All right, so this increases as education increases, which I thought was an interesting tidbit. All right, so what percentage of adults age 18 or older meet the physical guidelines for aerobic, you know, cardio, that type of thing, but also in, you know, muscle building type of activities? Strength, what, what percentage? 40, oh, you guys are, no, let's go back to the 23%. So all that means is that twice a week, you're doing some type of resistance training. You're pulling, you're pushing. Um, it could be body weight exercises or you're in the gym, those type of things. But the point of this was to show you that we're not getting healthier. If it was exercise and over half of us are doing 150 minutes of aerobic activity, we should be getting healthier, right? Okay. So now we're gonna take a little tour of our healthcare system. And this is another one of our root cause analysis. We're looking at all the possible causes. So this is my friend, Dr. A and Dr. B. And they're really busy, right? So they're mopping up what I like to consider, this is our chronic disease, this is our health care. And they're doing their best. They're looking down and they're scrubbing. So what I'm gonna do is go through each of these opportunities to explain to you what I hear all the time is the potential cause of why we're not getting better. So first of all, this is our sick care system. Maybe we don't have enough mops or access to mops. Do we have enough doctors? Do we have enough clinics? How many of you have heard this is an access to healthcare ratio? Maybe some of you have, exactly. I don't know, is it? Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe those doctors we're turning out of our medical schools are just not the brightest. I don't know, we turned out some pretty brilliant minds in this country. We have people trying to come here to be educated. I don't know if that's it either. Well, let's try something else. We don't spend enough. Hmm, well, we spend the most money of any other country in the world. We have the most complex system, healthcare system. Surely that's the cause, right? No? All right. Ah, so maybe we're using the wrong technique. Do I need more surgeries? Maybe I need more robots doing surgeries. Could that be it? Right, did you know just last month, the American Academy of Pediatricians, pediatrics, actually called for better access, there's that word access again, for obese teenagers that have bariatric surgery. We're sending our children to an operating room because they're obese. I wish I could make this stuff up, but I can't. 
Maybe the sink isn't big enough. Our healthcare system is not complicated enough. Maybe. Did you know you spend on average about $19,000 per person to have access <laughs> to our healthcare system and a quarter of those costs are actually going to administrative costs just to deliver healthcare because our system has become so complex. Maybe that's the cause? No? Oh, you're a tough audience. All right, let's try this one. The mop is not big enough. Maybe I don't have enough drugs, fancy drugs. Maybe I need a cholesterol pill that costs $5,000 a month. That's going to be the answer. No? Goodness, you guys are not letting me off the hook. Ah, maybe it's the rate of the water is too fast, or maybe the water's changed. You know, we are human. We have genetics. Surely this is all genetics, and we've evolved over the last century to just become sicker and sicker. Is that the cause? Because, you know, we evolve really quick in the U.S. <laughs> That's not it either? Ah, oh, fine. <laughs> all right. So let's just go a little bit about those doctors, where they came from. So medical education teaches us how to be reactive and not proactive. Remember, that was one of our points to ponder. So currently, our state of health is a fit in our failed system, right? It's, this is the result. We have a very poor healthcare system, and we're just getting garbage in, garbage out. Maybe you've heard that term before. So what we do is we address diseases versus pharmaceuticals and expensive medical procedures. It's not working. So we need a new healthcare system, right? So now we're gonna start thinking about well, what are the potential causes that we can give solutions that have wide effect. <clears throat> we need to include physicians who are counseling the prevention and true prevention. And when I talk about prevention, I am not talking about what me, you, or doctors talk about. We need to do preventive medicine, mammograms, colonoscopies. This is what I describe as early detection. Yes, these are good in preventing, you know, maybe advanced disease processes, but early, we're just catching the disease earlier. I'm talking about true prevention is actually stopping it from ever developing. So in 2004, there was a study that showed that per an encounter, when a doctor speaks to someone regarding exercise, nutrition, those type of things, stress reduction, it's less than 60 seconds. So apparently, I need to tell you that some of the most important vital information of your life in 60 seconds. I'm not that good. I wish I was. All right, in 2012, there was a study that found that regarding physical activity, only 32% of patients said that their doctor mentioned it. And the doctors who do are typically ones who are active themselves. And trust me, we are not a healthy bunch. Doctors are some of the worst patients you'll ever meet, and there's m several reasons for that. But did you know physicians have the highest rate of suicide than any other prof profession? We don't take care of ourselves. We don't take good care of each other. So what's the answer? What should I be telling Dr. A and Dr. B to do? Look up and do what? Turn off the faucet. Turn off the faucet. Thank you. And maybe unplug the sink. So what is what would that be? <clears throat> well, I, th I would like to give you the answer of lifestyle medicine. How many of you have heard of lifestyle medicine? A few. Okay, good. So I got to speak to the, the medical students earlier, and some of them haven't heard about it either. So this is exciting. I'm glad to share this with you. Because I hadn't heard about it either eight years ago. So lifestyle medicine, this is the you know, million dollar definition. So basically what this is in, in my life as a doctor is my patient who has any number of chronic diseases, I'm sitting down with them and I'm having a conversation about how nutrition, whole food plant-based diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, healthy habit formation, looking at your relationships, looking what you're doing with your environment, who are you around, that is lifestyle medicine. And when I can make those changes, even if I can just get them to do one, guess what happens? There's a ripple effect that occurs. So they do one that leads to another, that leads to another, that leads to another. But I am delivering that message, and that's part of the answer. <clears throat> Does lifestyle medicine work? Well, in peer-reviewed evidence supports that clini in clinical practice, it can be used to prevent makes sense, treat and reverse. 
So I don't know how many patients that I have seen either, you know, via, I've done telemedicine, I've done patients in person many, many years. They say, you know what, but I was told I would never get rid of diabetes. Type 2 diabetes runs in my family. I, I'm, I'm just prone to it. You know, my dad died of a heart attack when he was in his 40s. I hear that all the time, but that is not the case. I have had patients that were on 70 units of insulin a day for years come off of it in seven days. Do you see the importance of stopping medications? Exactly. So we need to transition to a prevention-oriented reversal, disease reversal. And I mean, many doctors are afraid to use the word reverse disease, but that's exactly what happens. And this is not atypical. This is typical results. You know, you see those commercials for all the drugs <laughs> or all their weight loss successes. You know, these are not typical results. They're the ones that they put on the, the commercials. These are typical results. Imagine what would happen. How well does it work? Well, let's learn real quick. Population studies demonstrate that a healthy lifestyle may prevent many, many things. And what is a population study? They look at a broad swath of people who live in a particular region. First of all, 90% of all heart disease prevention. Wow. And 81% of heart attacks. So remember I mentioned 600,000 Americans will die this year of a heart attack? What if I could prevent 81% of them? That'd be pretty awesome. My granddad might be alive. He died at 46, younger than me. 50% of strokes. How many of you have known someone who suffered from strokes? That has got to be some of the most devastating, sad things I've ever seen. The hum I mean, it's just the dignity that they, they, they struggle with. 93% of diabetes and 36% of cancers. Remember, diabetes increases risk for the heart attack, the stroke, the cancer. Now imagine if I could prevent 93% of that. Wow. And decrease the mortality in overweight, obese groups. And at the same time, every single habit that they adopt is going to be very, very powerful. So remember, this is an additive effect. Start with one, and it goes, and it goes, and it's an amazing snowball effect. All right, so I'm going to show you this other video, but I want to set you up for it. <laughs> You're like, oh, goodness, another video. But what this is is that doctors need to be on the front line. So there was a Dr. Christakis. I had a book here earlier. It's called Connected. And he's an MD, PhD, one of those really smart people that like to be in school. And then he goes into research. And what they do is they just, they were actually studying social science network or, or social contagions. How many of you have heard of something like that? Okay, good. So we're learning some new stuff today. So social contagion just means that uh, behaviors can spread through a network of people. Just like you know you have the flu virus, you hear someone, oh, they had the flu virus in Florida and then it spreads up the East Coast. Is that, it's the same idea, it, it spreads, it's contagious. So what they did was they took, how many of you have ever heard of the Framingham Heart Study? Great. So Framingham is Massachusetts, a little town. They started collecting data in 1948, okay? These people, there was a little over 5,000 of them that started. Their children then enrolled in 1971. And then in 2001, their grandchildren enrolled. So we have all these years of data that we can go. And then these people kept meticulous records. They took records of where these people lived, who their sister was, who their best friend was, who their neighbor was, how much they weighed, the colors of their eyes, all these incredible handwritten records. And what they did is they took 50,000 data points of these people over the course of 32 years, and you're gonna watch how obesity spreads in a community, okay? That's setting you up for this. This animation is a dynamic graphic representation of a portion of the Framingham Heart Study social network. Each circle or node represents one person in the data set. Nodes with red borders are women, and nodes with blue borders are men. The size of each node is proportional to each person's body mass index, or BMI, which is the weight in kilograms divided by the square of the height in meters. A yellow node represents an obese person with a BMI greater than 30, and a green node represents a non-obese person. 
A line between two nodes represents a social connection between two people. Purple lines connecting nodes denote close genetic ties, for example, parents, children, and siblings. Gray lines denote non-genetic relations, such as friends and spouses. Obesity is a multicentric epidemic, with many people influencing one another and forming ties in complex ways. The network gets more compact and dense as more ties appear. And the entire network gets heavier over time. Quantitative analyses demonstrate a tendency for obese people and non-obese people to form clusters within the network, so that by the end of the study, this clustering can be discerned, as in the densely interconnected clusters of obese persons here and here and the non-obese persons here. The prevalence of obesity appears lower at the periphery of the network as compared with the center. So does that make sense? That someone that you know is gonna have influence over your health? What if I told you, have you, how many of you have heard of the six degrees of uh, separation? Basically, you are six people away from knowing someone famous, okay? So what they come up with, and this shows over and over again, is three degrees of influence. So if I have myself and I have a friend, my friend has a friend and my friend's friend, that friend too removed from me that I don't even know has an effect on whether I may be obese or not. And this played out in multiple studies, not only obesity, but it's also poor health-promoting behaviors, but also healthy-promoting behaviors. So the person here is going to influence you at some point if you're three degrees separated. So you guys are all here. You may not know each other, but somehow you're interrelated. You are going to be affecting each other. So now imagine if I have a doctor that's in the middle of this network with a panel of 1,500 to 2,000 people, and I'm telling them about a whole food plant-based diet, how to decrease stress, sleeping better. Do you think that's gonna have an effect? Yes, because I'm not only probably the doctor of Jane, but her next door neighbor, Joe. Do you see how we're gonna begin having that influence? Now what if every doctor at every appointment gave them the same message? So now you have someone's cardiologist, someone's endocrinologist, and someone's oncologist telling them the same thing as their primary care doctor. So now you have four very influential people in someone's life in the same community giving them the same message. Someone's gonna take that message and change their life and then what are they gonna do? They're gonna tell their spouse, their daughter, their son, their neighbors, their friends, their colleagues. Do you see how this starts to happen and change? That's the power of social contagion. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So what does that look like? So you saw a bunch of dots of thousands of people. But what does that look like in one person's life? I want to show you a clip of my friend Josh Lejani. Josh started out at 400 pounds and ended up losing over 200 pounds and in running a 100-mile race and showing up on Runner's World cover. It was started, uh, this clip came from a big change, the film, he's a good friend of mine who made it, his name is Jason Cohen. And I think you're gonna find, this is again, just real quick, he's from Louisiana, so if you hear a bit of a draw, you're not mistaken. Over the last, say, two and a half, three years or so, I've lost about uh, between 200 and 220 pounds. All through my childhood, everybody would say, oh, you're gonna be just like your Bam Bam, because I was the oldest, right? Oh, you're gonna be just like your Bam Bam, you're gonna be big just like your Bam Bam. So it becomes this thing, like a predestiny. I'm gonna be just like him. That's how you get to be 400 pounds. You start identifying with big. That's who I am, just like my name is Josh. So that's, Josh was just living up to what was expected of him. That was his social, network it was his granddad who was over 400 pounds and i'll have you know josh's siblings and his mom they all went on a whole food plant-based diet that's how they lost hundreds and hundreds of pounds and now they're creating social change in louisiana deep south remember where that dark spot started so the, it, this these are people like this 
or like you who are causing social change. Very exciting. All right, so what does all this mean? Let's just kind of wrap it up. Social contagion is the spread of ideas, attitudes, and behaviors. And this can be in a group through imitation or conformity, which makes sense, right? So like I was talking to the medical students earlier, and I will tell you, I started medical school, my kids were five, three, and 10 months. Yeah, so when I could study, I usually wasn't at home. <laughs> so we grabbed some of these younger medical students and we would go to places that were not healthy, I'm sorry, and eat foods, but guess what? We were all eating the same. So we actually influenced each other. So we were, you know, group imitation, right? What's this mean? So there's two mechanisms at play. Because remember that, that third, three degrees of influence? I don't think it's gonna be someone I've never seen is not gonna influence me through imitation, right? Because I don't know them. But there's these things called social norms. So let's say that I have two friends. I have Joe and I have Jane, okay? Joe has decided, you know, he doesn't really care. Life is busy. His dad was overweight, he had poor eating habits, and he gains maybe 30, 40, 50 pounds. You love that Joe. Joe's a good friend, he's like a brother to you. Right, but so now you've come to kind of accept it. This is the norm, right? So, but there's many Joes in your life. But then you have Jane. Jane's your running partner, okay? You stay exercise, she's your healthy eating partner, she keeps you on track. But then suddenly, let's say Jane starts a new job and things get really stressful. She gives up running because she just doesn't have time. She's so tired every single morning. She can't get up early. But you've kind of already had some kind of influences over here. You're seeing this new social norm, right? Someone who's already overweight. And you're like, well, you know, so she's gained 15 pounds. She's busy. I'm not going to bug her about running with me. So do you see how now we have these social norms? Things become accepted. Just like chronic disease. 50, 60 years ago, there was not you know, 60% of Americans on medications for chronic disease. When did that become okay? It's these social norms that have changed. Does that, does that make sense, how that would become part of it? <clears throat> so remember that three degrees of influence rule and that your behavior actually is gonna affect people you don't even know. Makes you think a little bit more about your choices, right? Because I know, even for example, me walking through the grocery store in Rifle, Colorado, once there was people knew that I was actually vegan. I, by the way, I had a third of the baseball team. My son played baseball. They were plant-based <laughs> when Gabe played. Um, I would push my cart through the grocery store and people would look, what do you have in there? They, my choices on display at the grocery store makes a difference, right? Another really good um, illustration of this was that a, a couple, about a year and a half ago, I received an email from a patient of mine. Now mind you, I left um, Colorado and I went to Florida. I did some other stuff with Dr. Furman. So I left in 2015, but during my time there, I was able, 2016, excuse me, I was able to, to get a lot of people on a whole food plant-based diet because I got so excited. But I got an email from one of my old patients. She goes, Dr. Marvis, I don't know if you remember me, but I, I went on a whole food plant-based diet and lost this weight and felt great. But I had a friend of mine from high school on Facebook who I hadn't seen in 20 years who was complaining of lupus. She was really overweight, she wasn't feeling well, and she was really scared. The medications were having side effects. She just didn't know what her future was gonna hold. She goes, but I sent her some of your podcast, and I told her about a whole food plant-based diet, and I sent her some books and told her to watch Forks Over Knives. And she said thank you, and I thought she just thought I was some crazy vegan pushing my, my diet. But you know what, a year later I heard from her, and she lost 100 pounds reversed her lupus, and now she's taking people in her circle, and they have, some one of them's already lost 70 pounds. So I'm a doctor in Rifle, Colorado, who tells a patient to go on a plant-based diet. She chooses to do that, and then she uses her influence to influence others. So there's that third degree, right? The friend of the friend of the friend who I'll never know because I chose to make a statement and say you need to change, and this is how to do it. Do you see how powerful that is? And that's just one story. I've got lots of those. All right, so networks can magnify anything that they're seated with, good or bad, right? So it's not just obesity, but what if I told someone, if it, all the doctors in one community say, eat a whole food plant-based diet, what's gonna happen? 
someone stands by and says, you know what, you have to do exercise every single day, and doctors are sharing that message. And this is my, why it's so important that doctors can spark a new social, social contagion with the proper message. It's more than me spending 60 seconds saying you need to make a change. Like in the first video, you got to make a change. That's not the answer. I need to take the time to become invested in your life as your physician and make some suggestions that are really doable. A good example of this, by the way, is in the last 40 years, did you know smoking's decreased from 45% to 21%? It used to be the social norm. You can find advertisements with doctors touting their favorite type of, of cigarette. I wish I could make this stuff up. It really is disturbing. Uh, anyway, the impact of physician weight discussion on weight loss. Well, how much of an impact would I have? Well, they've done some studies, and they found that overweight and obese participants were more, signif more significantly likely to lose 5% of their body weight in the past year if their doctor told them that they were overweight. 5% may not seem like an, a lot, but it dramatically increases high blood pressure, your diabetes, your risk for heart disease. It makes a difference. So in summary, we're facing a healthcare crisis. I think I've laid that out, right? That's our, that's our problem. And if we don't do something, we're gonna devastate our economy. We're not gonna have anyone to defend our country. We're not gonna have employees. So if you have a 16-year-old that's now got type 2 diabetes in 20, 30 years, is she gonna be the employee that you want when she's amputated and lost you know, her kidney function? I mean, these are things you see all the time, end-stage renal disease, vision loss but they're gonna be getting it at 45 instead of 65 or 75. Medical school curriculum reform must include lifestyle training because I can't just have one doctor do this, I need all my doctors to do this. I've done my part, I, I had a baby and she went on to go to medical school. She knows this message. <laughs> but it's so important that we're all sharing the same message and that every single visit that you're hearing that from multiple facets in your community not just from your doctor, but from you as individuals also in their life. And when you get these changes, imagine what could happen. What would it be like that well, being well is actually the norm? <laughs> Instead of chronic disease, would we think we're in the twilight zone? Maybe. All right, and again, just physicians were in a very unique spot to create that social change. So what to do next? Like I said, physicians, we need to own our potential. We need to be responsible, and we need to be the spark in the community to create that change. Educating your colleagues, educating your nurses, because they have you know, also that social contagion. Edu you know, educating your medical assistants, your front staff, everyone. I tell you what, many of you have seen, you've heard of uh, drug reps, right? So they'll come to your office and what they're trying to do is educate you on the new drug. And what they would do is they bring in pizza. Everybody comes for, for pizza. Well, I'll tell you what, in Rifle, Colorado, none of them came without bringing healthy food by the time I got done with them. I'm having conversations. Medical students, so what was my message earlier today? It's like, you are the future. You are literally our hope <laughs> and our light in this dark world. <laughs> so please take the message and the torch and keep it going. You spread this message. Don't ignore it. Challenge your attendings. I don't know how well that will go, but you know, <laughs> you gotta be a rebel. And consumers and patients, so what can you as the everyday person do? Remember that three degree of influence. So it's not the celebrity, it's not gonna be you know, the, the person that you see on TV or Beyonce going on a plant-based diet, it's gonna be your neighbor or your friend, your spouse, your coworker who changes their diet, their life by doing something to improve their health through lifestyle changes. And if you have any questions and if you guys are interested, there's actually tons of resources at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And you can find them at lifestylemedicine.org. Thank you. Okay, so our question was, how do you actually try to convince someone who's extremely resistant? I have kids and their families, and I'm like, listen, you wanna be, you know, cause young people think they're immortal. <laughs> I thought I was immortal at one time. It's not gonna be health that's gonna be the message to convince someone. It might be the climate or animals. 
right? So I look at whatever lever I can do. I look at that individual, their particular needs, desires, wishes, and I think, well, what can I say to them that would allow them to change the trajectory of their life by changing their diet? So let's say it's my you know, 13-year-old son who is, wants to be a baseball star. Did you know that you have faster recovery and you can work harder and train harder because you're eating plants that are going to help you recover faster and become a better athlete? You're going to have this much more over all those other guys that you're competing against? Okay, if you have someone who's worried about the climate and their future and they, you know, you look at the acidification of the oceans, you're sharing knowledge that might be enough to get that an emotional response because it, we, we tend to be puppies. We, we, we respond with emotion. And so whatever lever you can think of to move, but those who are truly, truly just don't want to listen and want to be resistant, I just say you keep gently nudging. I had one patient who's a very good example of this. And I was, I think he ended up, he was overweight, he had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and I still see his face today, and he was just like, like this, right? He's like, I'm not, he goes, Dr. Morris, because you were a vet, and I'm just gonna be respectful, I'm gonna listen to you, but I'm not, I'm not gonna be a vegan. And I'm like, okay, well, thanks for listening. So I get super excited, like, I call it veggie crack. If I can get someone to eat vegetables and you get better, it's my dopamine rush for the day. Thank you. So eat more vegetables. So I get super excited because I'm like, what is the potential of your life? So I'm thinking, what is the one thing if you could do if you didn't have diabetes or crippling arthritis, what would it be that you would want to do? I make them start imagining a different future than the, than the path that they're on. What is, where could my journey actually be by changing just a little bit of what I put on my fork every day? And by the end of that visit, I will tell you, he changed not only his diet, he lost 60 plus pounds. He would come back to me and say, Dr. Marvis, I am telling my sister who's overweight and diabetic to change her diet and she won't listen. Why won't she listen? I'm like, I don't know, you tell me. You didn't want to listen to me either. So that's the type of thing. Just gently keep nudging and get excited about the potential of their life changing. People listen to that because that's a message you don't hear. You know, you don't go to a doctor and they're like, I get so excited about you coming off medicines and never seeing me again. Yes, put me out of business. That's the type of, that's the type of messaging we should be doing. We gotta be really good marketers. <laughs> Mahalo to all of you for coming and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.